Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, Shabbat Shalom. You know, in, in light of everything happening today uh, in the Middle East, I mean, the, the, the war in Israel against Gaza, against the terrorists, uh, the, the, scriptures say, the scriptures call uh, the Lord Adonai Zavaot. Do you know what that means? It means he's the Lord of the armies. Hallelujah. Uh, the, the scriptures also say that Adonai Yish HaMilchama. The Lord is a man of war. Uh, and he is active today on behalf of his people. And even though our, our primary warfare is it's a spiritual warfare, not a physical warfare, nonetheless, the Lord also acts on behalf of his people physically as well uh, as he goes before them uh, in their armies uh, and, and defends them. Uh, and there is a connection. Do not miss this. A connection between the physical and the spiritual. Uh, and... and uh, Just, when the, just as when the, the, the physical armies are defeated, something opens up in the spirit world in an amazing way. There's a definite connection there. So, for example, the greatest outpouring in modern history among our Jewish people, bringing the hundreds of thousands to the Lord, happened, began to happen right after the Six-Day War in 1967. You know, this great outpouring uh, upon young Jewish people all over the world, creating the modern Messianic movement uh, in, in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, and in the same way, I believe that when Hamas is defeated in the physical, it's going to open up something tremendous in the spiritual. And it's going to usher in a great outpouring, an end times outpouring and revival among our people. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is a connection between the physical and the spiritual as God goes forth ahead of his armies as a man of war. And that's a great segue uh, for our, our, our topic today. As you know, we're in a series on 1 John. Today's part 11. We're going to look today uh, at uh, chapter 3 and the theme of spiritual warfare. So turn with me to 1 John 3, verse 8. 1 John 3, verse 8. And, and John says, The one who does what's sinful is of the devil. Because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason, why did Yeshua appear? The reason the Son of God came was to destroy the works of the devil. And I want to submit to you that until we realize there's something in this world, there is something attacking you that needs to be destroyed, until you realize that, you will miss a major reason of why Yeshua came, why the Messiah came. The scriptures say Messiah appeared, he was manifested in the incarnation in order to destroy the works of the devil. Now, to put this verse in context, we're going to uh, look at the surrounding verses together. So turn with me to 1 John 2, 28, and we're going to read a uh, uh, long passage. Uh, and now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, you may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who does what's right has been born of him. Behold. What manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we, you and I, should be called children of God. And that's what we are. Hallelujah. <laughs> the reason the world doesn't know us is because it didn't know him. Dear beloved, now we're children of God, and what we shall be hasn't yet been made known. But we know that when Messiah appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, even as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin either has seen him or known him. That's now not a politi very politically correct verse is that. <laughs> Dear children, don't let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what's sinful is of the devil, because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. 
Here's our verse. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one who's born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who doesn't do what's right is not God's child. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother and their sister. Now, John emphasizes here the reality of sin. That sin scope is universal. Look at 1 John 3, verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And we all break the law. So at one level, we're all lawless. Because sin has permeated all of our lives. It affects us all. Uh, and sin's nature, John says, is lawlessness. What does that mean? It means sin is to look in the face of God and to say, no, I will not obey you. It's this defiant, uh, rebellious attitude, an attitude of lawlessness, uh, disobedience, rebellion, transgression, contempt, uh, defiance, disregard, despising God and his word. It's saying to the Lord, I'm going to live according to my laws and my ideas and my ideals, my ways, not your laws or ideas or ways. I will not submit to you or I will not serve you or obey you or worship you. This is the heart of Satan. This is the heart of sin. And indeed, John says that sin has its origins in the devil himself. 1 John 3 verse 8. He who does what's sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. This is a reference all the way to the beginning, even before the Garden of Eden, uh, when sin originated with the rebellion of the devil against God. The fall of Satan, where he was cast out of heaven to earth, and this leads us uh, to the picture we see in the Garden of Eden. In John 8, uh, the Pharisees and the Torah teachers, they're debating with Yeshua. Uh, and they say, well, we have Abraham as our father, you know, and God's our father. And then Yeshua says this in John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, holding on, uh, not holding on to the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. On the overhead, sin originates with the devil. And the point John's making here is that whenever you sin, you're following the devil. When you choose to sin and rebel against God's law, you're following the devil. So sin's scope is universal. It affects all of us. We are all guilty at some level of lawlessness. We, we all have looked at God from time to time and said, no, I'm going to go my way, not yours. And the origin of that is the devil himself. And, my, and Messiah says, I came to destroy the works of the devil. John emphasizes here in 1 John chapter 3 that Yeshua uh, uh, himself, of course, is without sin. Uh, in his very essence, his nature, is absolutely no sin. He's totally sinless. In his very nature, he abhors sin. He hates sin. He has nothing to do with it. And his mission when he came to earth was to destroy sin. Again, 1 John 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And what's the devil's work? Sin. Yeshua came to destroy lawlessness, the lawlessness that originated with the devil and has affected every one of us. Yeshua did this by his death on the cross, by his resurrection, by becoming the atoning sacrifice for our sins, by taking your sin upon himself. And this is really good news, amen. This is the gospel. Yeshua came to destroy sin by taking on the payment for your sin and, and your guilt on himself. And John says, now see how this should affect your life. 1 John 3, 6. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. John's saying being born again in Messiah uh, makes active intentional, continued, persistent sin inconceivable. A born-again believer confesses his sin and, and hates it and fights against it and flees from it and turns from it. And the next time he's tempted toward that sin, 
He's even all the more vigilant uh, because his life is united with Messiah. This is the perspective on sin that you and I need to have. Because in the body of Messiah today, we're so casual uh, and flippant about sin. And we take it so lightly. Uh, we're good at minimizing it uh, and justifying our own sin. So we need, need a new perspective on sin. Uh, a perspective that sees it as unthinkable. But if God's seed remains in you, you have this new life of God's spirit dwelling in you. So what happens? Now you begin to desire what he desires. Uh, and you want what he wants. Uh, and you think the way he thinks. And you live the way he lives. Because his life abides in you. His seed abides in you. And it's evident. And when he returns, we don't want to shrink back in shame. Uh, because we're living and, and groveling in sin. No. But rather, uh, he, we want him to find us living in purity uh, and, and righteousness and holiness. That's my prayer for you. Uh, that though, although we're surrounded by sin in this world, we will stand strong in Yeshua and not fall. So Paul writes this to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. But for you, O man of God, flee these things, these, these, these sins, and instead pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul exhorts Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, Paul's telling Timothy, Timothy, you are in a war. You're in a fight that requires uh, vigilance uh, and putting on the full armor of God. And that's what I want you to realize today. You are involved in a spiritual war, whether you realize it or not. Every single one of you, you are in a war. We are in war time. We are not in peace time. Hebrews 12 says, oh, we're in a war against sin. Uh, uh, 1 Peter 2 says, there's a war raging within our souls. Uh, Jude 3 talks about the struggle of our faith. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, Paul says, uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2 says that uh, uh, we're soldiers. In both 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul says, we have spiritual weapons that we're supposed to be fighting with. So look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And hear me well, he says, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Messiah. And then in Ephesians 6, 12, the famous passage, we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against authorities of this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil, of wickedness, uh, in heavenly places. The reality is every single one of you in this room is involved right now in a spiritual war. Recognize this. In every one of your lives, there are things going on that are attacking you and attacking your faith. Some of you in this room are in a battle for your marriage. Some of you are parents who are in a spiritual battle for the souls of your children. Maybe, and of course, that's made 10 times worse if those kids are in public school. There are battles for purity and, and chastity and holiness raging across this room. Some of you singles may, may be in relationships you shouldn't be in. Brothers, some of your minds are battlegrounds for lustful thoughts, inflamed by images that you let your minds see. Ladies, some of you are tempted uh, by gossip and you're giving into it. There's a war being raged, and Satan plays for keeps. There are battles over worry and doubt and despair, battles you face over your resentments and, and grudges and bitterness and unforgiveness, battles over addictions, battle over materialism. So the reality is you are involved in a spiritual war, whether you're at home, whether you're at work, whether you're at school, whether you're alone, whether you're with others, there's a spiritual battle raging. And if you're not a believer, there's even a greater spiritual battle raging for your very soul. Right now, we are involved in a spiritual war, and your enemy is formidable. 
spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, whose goal is to destroy you and send you to hell, or at least make you ineffective and powerless and defeated. There's an adversary who wants to wreck your marriage, who wants to alienate your kids from you. There's an adversary who wants to destroy your relationships, an adversary who wants to abolish your purity and attack your integrity and keep you from knowing the goodness and the glory of God. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says this, Be alert. Be sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for who he can devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. And although Satan is only a created being, of course, he's not God, Nonetheless, no matter how strong or how smart you think you are, you are no match for him on your own. And this spiritual warfare is universal, which means involvement in this war is not an option. It's not optional. You are in this war whether you know it or not, whether you want it or not. You don't choose to be involved in this war. It began the day you were born. You ignore it at your peril. The Bible does not say, ignore the devil and he'll flee from you. What does it say? For James 4, 7. It says, first submit to God and then, then resist the devil. And if you do both of these things, he will flee from you. If you try to avoid this war, if you pretend there's no struggle to be had or no war to be fought, then you will not stand. You will waver. You will falter. You will be defeated. Hear me well, spiritual retreat only leads to spiritual defeat. And note the stakes in this war are eternal. The casualties in this war aren't merely losing an arm or a leg or, or even your life. The casualties in this war are losing your eternal soul. Now the Lord desires every single one of you to be saved. But the little g, God of this world, Satan, he desires everyone in this room to burn in hell for all eternity. There's a cosmic battle going on all around you, and whether you like it or not, you're in the middle of it. And how you fight this battle has implications for your life for all eternity. Also implications for the life of others for all eternity. So the Bible exhorts you to fight the good fight uh, uh, for yourself, to become more and more like Yeshua, and to spread the gospel to others so that they may escape everlasting torment and enter into everlasting life. That's the good fight. So I want you to think about where this fight is being waged right now in your heart and in your soul and in your life. Maybe in your marriage or, or your parenting or in relationships. Maybe in your thoughts and your, and your emotions. Ask yourself, where are the points where the spiritual battle is raging most fiercely in my life? And I want, I want to encourage you uh, and also challenge you to fight the fight well. Paul gives Timothy in this passage here five exhortations uh, 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 here. And he says, first, first Timothy 6, verse 11, he says, As for you, O man of God, flee these things on the overhead. How do you fight the spiritual battle around you? Around you? Number one, you flee. You flee the evil that's pulling you away from God. Uh, you fight, first of all, by fleeing. You don't entertain uh, or think about the temptation. No, you flee from it. Sometimes running is the best way to fight for your life. Do not think you're strong enough to be surrounded by temptation and to resist. Realize your weakness. Run from enticement uh, and seduction and arousal and temptation. The scripture also says, says to run away from materialism and, and greed and strife uh, and selfishness and quarreling and slander and gossip and resentment and jealousy and bitterness and pride and superiority. Crucify these sinful heart attitudes. Run from every temptation to sin. Do not flirt with sin. No, you flee from sin. Not flirt, but flee. And be aware, sin always starts slowly. Sin always starts subtly. 
just one glance, just one web page, just one thought, just one kiss, just one minute. Don't take the first step. Run. Run from sinful desires. Uh, run from cravings that pull you from God. On the overhead. Now, in the spite of faith, we're not just running from sinful actions or sinful desires. Ultimately, we're running from sinful thoughts. It starts in your mind. We're told to fight the good fight of faith. And think about this. It's, it's the fight of faith. It's the fight of belief. It all goes back to what you believe about God in your mind. Eve was tempted because she believed that God didn't have her best interest in, in heart. Uh, and he was trying to hold her down and hold her back. So why are you tempted with materialism and greed? Because you don't believe that God is enough for you. So you ultimately fight materialism by belief in God. All of your struggles with sin ultimately come down to struggles with belief. Why do you lie? You lie because you believe in, in doing so, it'll be better for you. You lie because you don't believe God who says it's better to tell the truth. Why do you give in to sexual impurity? Because you don't believe God when he says purity is good and best for you. You believe that you have more delight uh, in impurity. So the way you fight this is by believing God and his word. Think about struggles with worry, with despair, with doubt. All of these are struggles to believe God. So on the overhead, what is worry? Worry comes when you struggle to believe that God will take care of you. What is this? Despair comes when you struggle to believe God is good. Doubt comes when you struggle to believe God is true. So in this fight of faith, flee sinful thoughts. And use your primary weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So how do you fight doubts about whether the Lord is with you? You fight it with, with, with the word of God, with uh, Joshua 1, with Matthew 28, which says, the Lord is with me always. And on, this ba on, the, on the basis of God's word, you say, I believe you are with me, Lord. If you're struggling with whether the Lord is really in control of your life uh, and really cares about you, how do you fight that? You fight it with Psalm 31, 15 on the overhead. My times are in your hands. Job 42, your purposes, Lord, will stand. Romans 8, you're going to work all these things out for my good, Lord, for I love you and I am called according to your purpose. On the, uh, you fight the, on the overhead here, you fight the fight of faith with the weapons of the word. So number one, you flee from sinful thoughts. Number two, then you pursue goodness, which draws you to God. So 1 Timothy 6.11, flee from sin and pursue these things, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. You run after these things. Righteousness, what's that? It's right thinking and, and right living. Godliness, it's godly beliefs, godly behavior. Saturate your mind and your heart with the life of God. Then Paul says, pursue faith. Pursue deeper trust in the Lord. Grow in your faith. You engage in spiritual warfare by fighting the good fight of faith. And you can even rejoice in your suffering. But why? Because it builds up your faith. Look at Romans 5, verse 3. We glory in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. Suffering, suffering, if properly processed, will lead you to hope. And then what happens? The next verse, Romans 5.5. 5. And hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So in the midst of your struggle, ask God for deeper faith. Pursue deeper trust in the Lord and in his word. And then Paul says, pursue love. Pursue deeper affection for God and for others. Nurture your heart's love for the Lord and for your neighbor. And meditate on Yeshua's words in John 15, 9, when he tells his disciples, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Wow. Think about that. Think how much Yeshua loves you. As much as the Father loves him. As much as the Father loves the Son. And Yeshua says, that's how much I love you. And then he says in John 15, 9, now remain in my love. And our response should be, yes, of course. Where else would I want to go? <laughs> so dwell on Messiah's love. Remain in his love. 
In the middle of your fight of faith, your heart is nourished by Yeshua's infinite love for you. Meditate on this. Let this truth of Yeshua's love for you, let it just warm your heart. In fighting the fight of faith, pursue love for God. Pursue love for, for your neighbor. Uh, love for your spouse. Love for your kids. Love for your parents. Love for your brothers and sisters here at Eskayim. Love for your classmates. Love for your co-workers uh, and your peers and your customers. Even love for your enemies, we're told. And then Paul says, in fighting this fight of faith, pursue patience, endurance, or patience. Even in the midst of difficult circumstances, press on with endurance. Do not give up. Be steadfast in your faith. Matthew 24, 13. He who endures to the end will be saved. Hebrews 3, 14. We've come to share in Messiah if indeed we hold our original confidence in him firm to the end. So pursue patience in difficult circumstances and pursue kindness towards difficult people. Patience towards difficult circumstances, kindness towards difficult people. The word Paul uses here for, for kindness is, is actually the word gentleness. There's a strength here, a, a quiet strength, a, a humble strength in gentleness. Yeshua's ways of warfare are not the ways of this world. It's not expressed in harsh and, 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 and uh, hurtful tones, but in a kind, gentle demeanor, even toward your enemies. Now, these six attributes you're to pursue, uh, righteousness, godliness, faith, uh, patience, gentleness, uh, I think of fun, and love, uh, these aren't natural for us, are they? These are only worked out in your life through the spirit of Messiah dwelling in you. So then Paul says this in 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the, of the eternal life to which you were called when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. On the overhead. So number one, you flee sin. Number two, you pursue righteousness. Now number three, you experience the life you've been given. You take hold of eternal life. As a Yeshua follower, you have his life within you. Uh, uh, but we all still struggle to experience the fullness of this life that's in us. It's a day-to-day -day struggle to experience the life that Yeshua has bought for you. But as you fight these spiritual battles, remember, you are called by his name. You belong to him. His name is in you. You are his. You are his child, his adopted child. So you, so you know the Lord is fighting for you. You have, uh, you have died to sin. You now live a new life in Messiah. So live in light of God's presence within you and know that God is for you and with you. And therefore, Paul says this in 1 Timothy 6, verse 13. In the sight of God, I charge you to keep these commands without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Live your life in view of Messiah's faithfulness to you. This is the Savior who died for you and now stands beside you in battle. And the Savior who died for you, by the way, is also the King who's coming for you. So we fight this fight of faith with our eyes fixed on Him. And when He returns, we don't want to be engaged in sin. Look at 1 John 2, 28. And now, dear children, continue in Him so that when He comes back, when He appears, you may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. Yeshua is coming back for the faithful not for the faithless. So we fight the fight, the good fight of faith. And then in 1 Timothy 6, uh, Paul then now kind of uh, erupts in praise to God. Uh, so now on the overhead uh, with this message. And number four, we, we, are to, we are to live in the awe of God's greatness. Paul just overflows with this majestic, majestic glorious ascription of praise to God. Look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 15. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. When you feel weak, look up. When you're tempted, 
You resist the world and the devil and the flesh by praising God. He is for you, and he is your sovereign. So, so take up these weapons of praise and worship. Cancer is not sovereign. Family breakdown is not sovereign. Difficulties and disappointments are not sovereign. Strife and contention and disunity, not sovereign. Temptation, not sovereign. Despair, not sovereign. The Lord God is the sovereign of the universe. His rule is universal. His reign is invincible. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's immortal. He's beyond time and space. He dwells in blinding holiness and purity and glory. To him be all honor and eternal praise and dominion. He possesses all power. He deserves all praise. Do not underestimate the power of praise and worship in spiritual warfare. On the overhead, then number five, finally, Paul says, you fight the good fight of faith by guarding all spiritual truth. Look at verse 20. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. Guard what's been entrusted to your care. You fight, the good, you fight to be faithful to the gospel, to never compromise it. Do not teach any different doctrine. Appoint leaders who are faithful to this word. Hold on to the faith. Train yourself in the scriptures. Devote yourself to the study and the public reading of the word. A key part of spiritual warfare is guarding and proclaiming the gospel. Paul says those who depart from the gospel have been handed over to Satan and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Now don't be puffed up and smugly say, I would never waver from the gospel. Paul is warning this to Timothy himself, Paul's own disciple, the head of the congregation at Ephesus. So this should be a wake-up call to all of us. No one, not one of us, is immune from temptation to wander from the gospel, from the faith. So fight to be faithful to this good word, to this good news. For the gospel is the power of God for salvation, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. And one of the adversary's chief aims is to keep you silent about the gospel, to not share it with others, others who are hurling headlong into hell without the saving power of Yeshua that's proclaimed in the gospel. So, so fight against fear. Fight against the desire for man's approval or man's acceptance. Fight against whatever would prevent you or, or hinder you from sharing the good news of Yeshua the Messiah. When you share the gospel with an unbeliever, know there is a spiritual battle raging at that moment. And know the Holy Spirit who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. There's a power in the gospel to overcome the lies of the enemy. That's the, these lies that are trying to keep the unbeliever in darkness. So don't shrink back. Fight the battle. Share the gospel. Fight against temptation to create this kind of religious bubble. Oh, a self-centered, uh, self-satisfied, self-contained messianic faith that's enshrouded in this cocoon uh, that never shares your faith with others. Others who are heading to a Yeshua-less eternity. Fight against that. And know that as you fight this fight of faith, you fight this spiritual war, um, you don't fight it for victory, you fight this from victory. Because Yeshua has already won the ultimate victory in his death and resurrection. He has conquered sin and death and the grave and hell and Satan. So as you remain faithful to Yeshua, your victory is guaranteed. Keep your eyes fixed on Yeshua. Always being ready for his return. In engaging in spiritual warfare, John makes it clear, ultimately, there's only going to be two classes of people. Look back at 1 John 3, verse 10. This is how we know who the children of God are and the children of the devil are. Anyone who doesn't do what's right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. John says there are two classes of people and only two classes of people in this world. We're either all children of God or children of the devil. Now feel how unpolitically correct that statement is. Just say that anyone who's not in Messiah Yeshua is a child of the devil. <laughs> Try posting that on Twitter. <laughs> 
or Instagram or Telegram or Facebook. But this is what the scripture says. The origin of sin is the devil. And he has led millions and billions of sinful hearts in rebellion against God. Yeshua himself says in John 8, that all who live in sin are children of the devil. John says anyone living in lawlessness and in rebellion against God and his word are children of the devil. They are slaves to sin. They're going their own way. They're rejecting God's way. Men, dads, fathers, husbands, ask yourself, am I living according to God's word or according to my own laws? Am I living under the authority of God? Women, wives, mothers, are you living according to your own ways, your own ideas? If so, John says you're living as a child of the devil. Children, students, teenagers, in your life, are you submitting to the authority of God? Or are you rebelling against his authority? Those who live as slaves to sin are children of the devil. Unless they were, and unless they repent, the scriptures say they are deserving of death. So, Lord, help us to feel the weight of this. There is a devil, an adversary, an accuser of the brethren. And he desires to take you to hell. And he's intent on making the path there, hear me well, he's intent on making the path there as smooth and as comfortable and maybe even as religious as possible. And Yeshua says, I came to destroy the works of the devil so that you might be a child of God. Do you feel the wonder of 1 John 3, verse 1? See, what great, literally in the Greek, what otherworldly love the Father's bestowed and has lavished upon us, that we should be called God's children. And that's what we are. Think of it. The infinitely holy God of the universe has looked upon you, who by nature are children of the devil, rebels against him, dead in your trespasses and sins, by nature, wanting nothing to do with him. And he has not only, uh, he's not only just sent his son to die for your sins and atone for your sins. Yeshua hasn't just uh, 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 sacrificed for you. He hasn't just loved you. He hasn't just uh, forgiven you. But, but if all that wasn't enough, he's now brought you into his divine family. As his child. As his son. His daughter. No longer a spiritual orphan but adopted into Messiah's family. I think about my own daughters, how much I love them. And then I think about how much the Lord God, before the foundation of the world, has set his affection on you and on me. Ephesians 1, verse 5, he's predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Yeshua the Messiah. The Father set, set his love upon you before the world began that you might be called a child of God. And that's what you are. A, God, a child of God who's now free from sin. Uh, feel the force of what John is saying here. How can a child of God, why would a child of God ever want to live like a child of the devil? There's no way. We're his children, God's children. And not only are we his children, but Hebrews 2.14 says this, that he, Yeshua, shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, namely the devil, and thereby free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Yeshua, by his crucifixion and resurrection, destroyed the works of the devil so that you and I would be free from the slavery due to our fear of death. So that once God's seed is in you, once Messiah's life is in you, it takes root, and it germinates, uh, and it grows, and it yields the fruit of eternal life with the Lord. So no matter what trouble this life brings, no matter how malignant the tumor is, no matter how little odds the doctor gives you, no matter how unexpected the tragedy is, in the end, we are no longer slaves to death. Now we are defeating death. And we have no need uh, to fear death any longer. Because we know that the children of God ultimately defeat death. So now we can say with Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. 
when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that's written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord, Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand and pray. Thank you, Lord. Let the music team to please come up. Lord, thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, today. Thank, thank you so much. that You sent your son, Yeshua. Why? To destroy the works of the devil. And to, to rescue us from our slavery to him. We were held in bondage to the enemy. But you, Yeshua, broke his power and broke his hold on us. And you delivered us by your blood, by the blood of the new covenant uh, that sets us free from sin and death and the grave and hell and Satan. Hallelujah. So why, Lord, would we ever want to go back under bondage? Lord, as your child, we would not. We know that when we sin, we're following the devil. And so, Lord, today we renounce all sin in our lives. We renounce the devil and his works. Thank you, Yeshua, that we are more than conquerors in you. And in you, we have the victory. You are, you are the knights of the Lord of the armies. Yeshua, your seed abides in us. And we ask you for that seed now to grow and to bear much fruit so that more and more we desire what you desire. And we want what you want. And we think like you think. And we live like you live. Lord, help us today to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, because spiritual retreat only leads to spiritual defeat. So Lord, help us to flee sinful desires and sinful actions. And most of all, sinful thoughts. To take every thought captive. To fix our minds on you, Lord, and your kingdom and your ways. Lord, we claim your salvation and your kingdom ways. We claim it for our marriage. We claim it for our children. We claim it for our families and our relationships with our friends and our peers. We claim it with our relationships with our fellow brothers and sisters here at Eskayim. Lord, help us to pursue righteousness, love, patience, kindness, gentleness, your kingdom values as we withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. And we wield the sword of the Spirit, your word. And we pray this all in your name, Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.